started. Once again, good morning, everyone. I'm Professor Barlow Dermogradichin of the Armenian Studies Program at Fresno State. Uh, for those of you on the East Coast, good afternoon. And those of you that are joining us from overseas, uh, good evening. I'd like to welcome you to this uh, special presentation. It's part of the fall 2021 lecture series of the Armenian Studies Program. And this lecture series is supported uh, through the financial support of the Leon S. Uh, Peters Foundation here in Fresno, California. I want to tell you a little bit about an upcoming event that we have coming up in two weeks. Dr. Suren Manukian, who is the Kazan Visiting Professor in Armenian Studies uh, for this year, for this fall 2021, will be giving the final uh, lecture in a three-part series on the Armenian Genocide. And his lectures were on the organizers of the genocide, uh, the architects of the genocide, and then on the, on the bureaucrats of the Armenian Genocide. And his final presentation his final presentation on Friday, November the 12th at 7 p.m. in California time is going to be on uh, the, the topic of the ordinary killers of the Armenian genocide, the lower level perpetrators. It's been a very interesting three-part series. So if you can join us uh, for that, uh, the link, uh, I will post the link in the chat in just a few minutes uh, during, the, during the presentation. Today, our special guest is Dr. Umit Kurt, who is a historian of the late Ottoman Empire. Uh, and his focus is on the transformations of the imperial structures and their role in constituting the Republican regime. Uh, Dr. Kurt received his doctorate from Clark University in 2016. And since then has held a number of postdoctoral positions, including the Kazan visiting professorship in Armenian studies at Fresno State. Currently he is a Polonsky uh, research fellow at the Van Leer Institute, which is based in Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem. He also teaches in the Department of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies at Hebrew University of Jerusalem. He is a prolific author and scholar, and he has published uh, two books, uh, more actually, this is his third book, but he has previously authored Einteb 1915, Genocide and Perpetrators, and is the co-author of The Spirit of the Laws, The Plunder of Wealth in the Armenian Genocide. Today, Dr. Kurt will uh, give a talk based on his newly published book, which is called The Armenians of Eintab, The Economics of Genocide in the Ottoman Empire, or in an, in an Ottoman province, excuse me. And this book was just published by the prestigious Harvard University Press in 2021. I highly recommend that you pick up a copy of that book because uh, what Dr. Kurt has done is to present a micro history of uh, the Armenians living in uh, this province and the economic side or dimension of the genocide which sometimes has been overlooked in genocide studies. What's interesting also is that Dr. Kurt is a native of uh, Aintab. He was born in Aintab. And in a way, the book uh, mirrors his own journey of understanding about the once prosperous Armenian community of Aintab and how that changed, of course, with the genocide. And then about the, he discusses in his book about the the, the new elites, the new political and economic elites who benefited from the economic dimensions of the genocide. So it's my pleasure today to welcome our special uh, guest speaker, Dr. Umit Kurt. Dr. Kurt. Thank you so much, Professor Mogherdichian, uh, for such an informative and generous introduction. I'm so happy to be with you uh, virtually. I wish I could be with you in person because uh, as I keep mentioning uh, and pointing out, Fresno is my second home after Aintab, let's say Gaziantep or Antep. So uh, I hope uh, I, will, I will be with you uh, physically, face-to-face, -face, in the flesh, uh, in the nearest future, let's say. Um, uh, as Professor Mugurd, and I would like to thank and express my gratitude for the, the generous support and, and, and also uh, constant support of our main studies program at Fresno State University towards my work uh, since the outset of my academic career, let's say. And, as Professor Mugurdichian has just pointed out, today's talk is basically, uh, is, is mostly based on my uh, recently published book by Harvard University Press in May, 2021. And I would like to, uh, I would like to start with sharing my screen because I am gonna be having a PowerPoint uh, presentation. Let me share my screen, if you will. There you go. So, 
yeah, this is the cover of the book. The cover of the book, uh, actually, you see uh, uh, the, the, the family, and this family is uh, the Nazar, Nazaretian uh, family, uh, Nazar Aga, Black Nazar Aga, and the head of the family, who was an honorary Iranian consular of, of, uh, to, to, to Ottoman Empire in Aintab at the time. As you see, uh, he, he's uh, standing on the left by holding his stake and, and, and also his wife, uh, Hanum, and, and also and the Garabet uh, Nazar, Nazareti and the little son as well. So I would like to start with, um, let me, sorry, okay. I would like to start with how my, how my uh, story and uh, begin begun actually for writing writing this book and how the idea for writing this book originated and tell you a little bit about the research process and share the relevant story of my discoveries um following my graduation from middle east technical university in ankara i found myself again at my parents house in my hometown of gaziantep formerly known as aintab where i escaped the stifling heat and passed the days dozing on the sofa one day, I was jarred from my nap by a call from an old friend. Umid, where have you been? Has been ages. I know a great place in Kayajik where we can catch up. Although I was born and raised in Aintab and hadn't left the city under college, the word Kayajik did not mean anything to me. It was just another district in the city, a neighborhood I had never visited, of which I knew nothing. So my friend said she would wait for me at Papyrus Cafe, as you see, uh, in the, the front door of the Papyrus Cafe uh, and gave me directions. I took a bus to the Kayajik neighborhood and upon arrival found myself dazed by the charming atmosphere, letting myself get lost in the side streets and leaving my poor friend waiting some more. Embarrassed by my, uh, my obliviousness, I found, I found myself asking, where am I? What is this place? I was on a narrow street with beautifully constructed stone houses lining each side, taking, taking you back to a simpler, though slightly mysterious time. Tuck away uh, between the high rise concrete apartment buildings of so-called modernized Gaziantep. This neighborhood was like an architectural mirage. I felt nostalgic for a past that was never mine. So finally I found Papyrus Cafe, which turned out to be located in one of those exotic houses. Like most of the houses on the street, it had been converted into a coffee coffee shop as part of the process of restoring the city. Upon entering, a few letters carved out at the top of the majestic gate caught my eye. Not recognizing the script, I simply assumed these were Ottoman characters. Inside, I was once more left speechless. There was this uh, there was a spacious courtyard with staircases on either side leading up to two large rooms welcome me. The rooms were filled with antique furnishings and the high ceilings were adorned with frescoes and engravings. The experience was kind of <laughs> historical voyeurism for me, like stepping into a living museum. Feeling a surge of pride in my hometown and ancestors, I decided to talk to the owner to try to glean some information about the history of the house. I approached him intending only to compliment his establishment. But before I could stop myself and ask, I was just wondering, from whom did you get this place? Who was here before you? He wearily explained that he inherited this place from his grandfather. It must have been especially a strong coffee they were serving that day as I was emboldened to press further. And how about your grandfather? From whom did he buy this place? The man paused hesitantly before responding, and then after a few moments, he softly murmured to the ground beneath him, there were Armenians here. I said, what Armenians? What are you talking about? Were there Armenians in Gaziantep? He nodded. I was getting annoyed with the, actually the opacity of his answer. So what happened to them? Where did they go? He responded to me indifferently. They left. As I rode the bus back home, I pondered, why the Armenians, why anyone would just leave and hand over such an exquisite property to someone? 
I was a naive to the point of ignorant 22 year old university graduate, unaware of the existence of Armenians in my hometown. And a few years later, I would find out that the house belonged to Nazar Nazaretian, honorary consulate to Iran, who was a member of Eintop's wealthies and the most prominent family. And he, his grandchildren, his children and his grandchildren used to live in this house. And those letters above the gate were not Ottoman, but Armenian, spelling out the name of Karanazar A, who built the house. So therefore that building is no longer Papyrus Cafe for me. For me, it's the house of Nazar A, the Nazaretian's home, the house uh, uh, and other houses in Kayacik are the homes of Barsumians, Prenians, Akhchians, Krachians, Leilekians, Jebejians and Karamanukians for me, who were deported from the city in August 1950. So this is the story about how the idea to work on this topic and write a book out of it came out basically. So th my book is the story of Aintap Armenians who were torn away from their homes, neighborhoods and the city where they were born and raised. So this is the account of how their material and spatial wealth changed hands and was transformed. This is the historical record of their persecution and subsequent erasure. So I would like to point out a couple of general remarks about the book, like the gist of it. So uh, my, the book digs into details of the Armenian dispossession process that produced the homogeneously Turkish city in which I grew up. In particular, I examined the population that gained from ethnic cleansing and genocide. Records of land confiscation and population transfer demonstrate just how much new wealth became available when the rich Armenians who were active in manufacturing, agriculture production and trade were ejected. Although the official rationale for the removal of the Armenians was that the group posed a threat of rebellion in the eyes of Ottoman government, the CUP, Union, the Committee of Union and Progress, then Ottoman ruling government, I showed that the prospect of material gain was a key motivator of support for the Armenian genocide among the local Muslim gentry and Turkish public. Turkish public. Those who benefited most, provincial elites, wealthy landowners, state officials, and merchants who accumulated Armenian capital, in turn financed the nationalist movement, the Kemalist nationalist movement in Ankara that brought the modern Turkish Republic into being. So the economic elite of Aintab was therefore reconstituted along both ethnic and political lines. First of all, the book offers a fresh take at anal analyzing the murder and plunder of the Armenians of Aintab. Uh, it provides a historical analysis of the local dynamics while paying attention to the political, ideological, social and economic climate in the city. Uh, Aintab the crucially important town and district of the time and located in the south southeastern Anatolia, also referred to as Cilicia. Can you guys uh, see my uh, PowerPoint? Not yet, uh, Umid, you need to share the screen. There you go. All right, so I'm sorry. So this is the Nazaretian's house I'm basically talking about. And this is 19th century panoramic view of Aintab, as you can see from here as well. You can see on the top, Surp uh, Asvazetin Yegeretsi, the Armenian Orthodox Gregorian Church in Aintab. And here is our map. As you see, Aintab is, is like 50, 50, 50, 50 miles, uh, five miles away from Aleppo. And and this map, you can see the deportation roads in 1915. So, um, by combining social, socio-political, and uh, socio-historical, socio-economic historical methods, this book treats Aintab as a microcosm to elucidate the confiscation and transfer of our main properties. So. What I, what I essentially show that this process is an essential component of a genocidal policy and demonstrate how the prospect of material improvement 
serve um, as a major incentive for garnering the support and involvement of the Muslim gentry in the Armenian genocide. So it convincingly shows the Armenian genocide and its redistribution of redistribution of uh, a wealth to local Turkish and other Muslim groups help nationalize the economy and help create new local elites in the city. So accompanying the massacres, the confiscation and plunder process of Aintop Armenian's properties can be divided into three periods. So in the first period, World War I, both the CUP itself as well as Muslim elites and ordinary Muslims pillage Armenian wealth. In terms of the CUP policy regarding the removal of the Armenians from the economy, a clear legal framework was required. These laws and statutes came to be known as the Envalimetric Economy, the Abandoned Properties Laws. In the second period, post-World War I period, 1918 and 1921, after the Ottoman defeat, the process of restitution commenced in the city was later discontinued. And in the, Sa in the Saipico agreement concluded secretly on May 19, 1916, the French and Britain carved the Arab territories of the former Ottoman Empire into spheres of influence. Under Saipico, the Syrian coast and the modern day Lebanon was annexed by France and Britain took direct control of central and southern Mesopotamian territories. Based on this agreement and the seventh article of Mondras Armistice from October 13, 1918, British forces occupied in Ayintab in December 1918. So the primary and most urgent tasks of British occupation forces were to facilitate uh, the return of Armenians to their homes, to restore their properties and assets, and to find and deliver Armenian women and children who had been held in Muslim houses to their families or relatives. Armenian survivors start to return to their hometowns in December 1918, most immediately concerned with discerning how their mobile and immobile properties would be returned to them. So this issue of restitution of properties was of pressing importance for Ottoman government. Related orders were sent to localities and necessary legal regulations were issued. However, the British decided to cede the city to the France, France by signing the Syrian agreement with the French government on September 15, 1919. According to this agreement, the French forces would replace the British in October 1919 a situation that dis disrupted the restoration process. Local authorities became more reluctant to return the Armenian properties to the survivors, even if ordered to do so by the Minister of Interior. Although houses were occasionally returned to their rightful owners, in most cases, local authorities refused to evict the present occupants. And additionally, the rise of the Kemalist nationalist movement in the city in 1919 and 1920 also put a halt to the restitution process. So in the face of French occupation, local nationalist Kemalist forces instigated armed struggle against the French. Throughout the Turkish-French war in Aintab, which started on April 1st, 1920, and ended with the Kemalist defeat, and the city surrendered to the French military forces or in February 1921, the Armenians of Aintab allied with the French. Yet, despite their victory, the French ultimately decided to retreat from the city in February 1921, leaving it on October 20th, 1921 to the Kemalist forces in accordance with the Treaty of Ankara. And in the third period, post-1921 period, with the total departure of the Armenians from Aintab, the confiscation and plunder process was completed. So, uh, and... Armenian properties were mainly sold by auction to Aintab's local elites who participated in the Turkish-French war and who supported national forces financially and logistically. And by the way, these auctions were uh, organized by internal revenue office of the city and the local administration's uh, initiative. So economic wealth began to change, hence following the Armenians' deportation. This wealth was liquidated by the commission and was used for various purposes. With the redistribution of Armenian properties, a new wealthy Turkish Muslim elite class emerged in Aintab after 1915. So it's possible to divide the emergence of this new bourgeois, bourgeois, bourgeois class 
into two periods. The first one took place between 1915 and 1918, when the Eintracht's new elite bourgeoisie was born. The second period from 1921 to 1922, and afterwards, when this new class social status was consolidated through liquidation of Armenian's wealth and property after their total departure. Here, I will focus on the first period. In the book, though, uh, I have analyzed three peri periods in detail by making use of various archival sources. So, uh, properties belonging to Ottoman Armenians were seized through various laws, degrees, and other legal regulations passed by the CP government and later the rank and file of the Republican regime. And both governments con uh, concocted ways of making this illegal process look legitimate under the veil of the law. So central to this process were the economic outcomes of violence committed against Armenians. So principally in the book, what I economic violence refers is the appropriation of mobile and immobile properties and assets left behind by the deported Armenians. Of course, Armenians were forced to leave these, these properties. The process was abetted by the legal system through which an entire community was reduced to state of status of non-existence. So after CUP issued the decision for deportations, Ottoman Armenian citizens were prohibited from selling, renting, or transferring their properties. And the whole process was put into action by commissions established by the CUP government. And these commissions were called Abandoned Properties Commissions and Abandoned Properties Liquidation Commissions. In the book, I did I detailed how these regulations were actually uh, were executed, actually and formally not executed, uh, specifically with the Armenians of Aintab in mind, concentrating on the appropriation of these properties. I investigate how what happened to these properties, primarily by using Armenian sources and other archival materials. I present a unique report of the Aintab Liquidation Commission, previously untapped and undiscovered that documents the liquidation process on the ground. It's the first of its kind in demonstrating how numerous government officials and other individuals from different classes, particularly Aintab Muslim elites, including property assessors, auction houses, trustees, estate agents, notaries, and transport companies were employed to manage the administration and sale of our main assets through the abundant properties laws. So I want to start with an anecdote here, which was quite interesting. Uh, in the aftermath uh, of the Aintab war, Aintab Ingna Bashtuchun, let's say, Aintab self-defense, there was this town crier walking around town and inviting those who had participated in the war to come to Tushana. Many locals of Aintab, including Ali Beshe, uh, here Ali Beshe, here, uh, here it is. Ali Beshe, uh, who was a prominent member of the Eintop's gentry and leading figure of the Eintop CUP club, uh, they headed over. A guy told them to queue, queue up in twos as they would let people in two at a time. It was Ali Beshe's turn. He went in and saw some keys placed on a rock. Each person takes two, commanded the guy in charge. Uh, there were also other medallions lying on the rock. Ali Beshe take, took a quick glance and said, so that's what we save Aintab for? For two keys and a piece of tin? Thanks. And he left. Who would have guessed that those two keys belong to the Armenians? And they were keys to two Armenian houses. So... Um, As I have stated in the beginning, abandoned properties in Aintab were confiscated and liquidated first so-called legally and formally by using June 1915 uh, law, which stipulated the establishment of abandoned property commissions. And then in, in, on 26th of September 1915, the first liquidation commission was established uh, uh, and uh, to liquidate our main properties. And counterpart of the same liquidation commission was also founded in Aintab 
in September 1915. Uh, but there were also five sales and profiteering in Aintab. And the first deportees who left Aintab, uh, they, they were promised that this was a temporary arrangement and they will return their homes if, in a few months. According to some survivor accounts, Armenians were told that they could leave everything, lock their doors, and either hold on to their keys or leave them with a the neighbor or the headman, Muhtar. They were also uh, assured that the government would carefully seal their properties and protect them. However, those uh, who received their deportation notice start to put their belongings up for sale at fire sale rates. Many Armenian families sought to rent or buy draft animals to be able to endure the long and hard road that, that lay ahead. Those who bore the heaviest brunt were well of Armenian families from middle or higher classes, particularly Armenian merchants and tradesmen. Um, after the deportation decision became definitive, they wanted to convert as many of their assets as possible to currency, and therefore they put everything they own on a market. Some trusted their Muslim neighborhoods with their valuables and other properties, hoping that they will eventually be able to reclaim their them upon their return. So for Muslims, this was a lifetime opportunity to seize the spoils. Kayajik and the other Armenian neighborhoods surrounding the city were transformed into a huge open bazaar in early August 1915. Hundreds of thousands of gold coins were sold for a fraction of their worth. Everything mobile was displayed in the streets and Muslims began to purchase these items for as cheap as dirt. Massive amounts of bedding, furniture, utensils were piled up in the Armenian quarter and sold at auction, seldom bringing more than a fifth of their value and often far less than that. Buyers determined the prices. On the one hand, uh, there were those who offered, uh, let's say, if you don't want to leave this behind, here is the price. On the other hand, there were those who tried to deceive Armenians, saying, let's put this stuff in my storeroom. It's yours when you return. Do not sell them in the auction. Uh, the Ottoman government, the CUP, was aware of the fact that people were buying the abundant properties at extremely low prices and then selling them at higher rates. Considering this chaotic uh, situation against the state's own interests, it attempted to manage the process more systematically so that the state could reap the greatest profits. Uh, they, they introduced various measures. Despite these measures, file sales carried on for months and mobile assets could be sold for like 20% of their real value. And this process of profiteering was one of the reasons for our main destitution and starvation in the deportation roads. And Maybe at this point, I should talk about the, the amount, uh, the approximate amount of the landed properties of Aintab Armenians. And there were 6,000 residential homes and 7,000 parcels of land that belonged to Aintab Armenians. It's possible to divide seized, seized and appropriated landed properties into four categories. The major immobile properties of the wealthy families, middle or second class immobile assets, public properties, and national properties or properties owned by religious institutions. Um, of course, there was an active participation of local elites in plunder process. Motivated by the promise of uh, acquiring mobile and immobile Armenian properties, local elites meticulously carried out orders sent by the unionists from the central government to ensure the success of Armenian destruction. An executive committee was established with the encouragement of the district governor Ahmed Faik Bey and the CUP deputy and also well known elite Ali Jenani. So its members included local notables, local CUP members, and civil, civil and military officers. These, were, uh, these members were the son of Debak Kimyazadeh, local merchant and well-known provincial elite Kadir, the son of prominent local notable and large, uh, large landowner Nuri Bey, the son-in-law of Seyafzadeh, prison warder Zeki, the son of gendarmerie commander Haji Halil, Seyafzadeh Abdul Efendi, Haji Halil Azadeh, Tahçizadeh Abdullah, Mennanzadeh Mustafa, and, and, and Ulema Bülbül Hoca, and so forth. 
um, this committee selected four representatives and sent them to Derzor to see the actual living conditions of Aintam Armenians firsthand and ensure that the circumstances render it impossible for them to return to Aintam. Having done so, they could seize Armenian properties without any reserve. So and these four representatives uh, confirmed the dire, dire situation of Aintam Armenians in Derzor and committee members freely participated in auctions organized by the Aintab Liquidation Commission. As they were closed with Tefik Bey, the president of Aintab Liquidation Commission, they were able to purchase valuable Armenian items at very low prices. So, um, of course, there were transactions done by Aintab Liquidation Commission to that uh, these were official transactions, state sanctioned official transactions. Prior to deportation, uh, Armenians were required to submit a petition to register their immobile and immobile properties. An instruction was in effect stating that these petitions had to be delivered to the Aintab Liquidation Commission within a day of receiving notice for deportation. Accordingly, in early December 1915, Armenians, mostly Protestants, who were in preparation to leave Aintab, submitted their petition to, 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 to have their houses registered by the Liquidation Commission. At the same time, the commission had already begun uh, sales of Armenian mobile goods and assets by auction. For instance, on 23rd of January 1916, houses of bakers, jewelers, shop owners, edge tool makers, and other artisans were registered by the Liquidation Commission so that the owners could be deported to Diyarbakir, Urfa, Sivas, and Adyaman. On March 6th of the same year, Liquidation Commission in Aintab start to sell goods and other objects preserved in Surf Asvazasin Church by auction as well. Armenian properties, moreover, Armenian properties were used for various purposes. It was used that these properties were used for uh, meeting military and governmental needs. And it was, for instance, the Ottoman army appropriated the buildings of Vartanian and Barsumian schools. In February 1916, Giligia Jemaran was transformed into a military hospital. And the numerous wealthy and prosperous Armenians who lived in Kayacik, all, uh, for instance, Nazaretians, Ahchians, Garuj Efendi Karamanukyan, Hovannes Jebejian, and Hadidians, Kalfayans, Ottoman soldiers, were settled in their houses. And the properties of Armenians, they were utilized and used also for uh, meeting the needs of refugees and immigrants, Muslim refugees and immigrants I'm talking about. For instance, Yervan Kuchikyan, a survivor, describes how an Armenian house was given to the refugees settled in Aintab, uh, saying, quote, after Dalians were exiled, another tenant came, he came in with a goat, and directly tied it to the room with red marble floors. One thing I remember was that the new tenant was a Turkish family. So here, at this point, I would like to talk about what happened to properties of certain Armenian families to make the case, to make the, to the property confiscation liquidation case much more palpable and concrete. Uh, so, I would like to come up with uh, a, a report of a liquidation commission about the Yakupian's family, Sarkis Yakupian. Two documents provided by Sarkis Yakupian's family offer previously undiscovered aspect of the liquidation process in Ainta. Yakupian's list, which I will be showing to you in a minute, these lists uh, are of great significance as they hint at what information on liquidated Armenian mobile and immobile pro properties in the Ottoman archives might conceal. Sarkis Yakupian was deported to Hama in December 1915. He died in Aleppo in 1922. I acquired this reports of liquidation commission from his grandchildren living in LA. And Liquidation commissions, by the way, they were founded in 34, 35 provinces and districts in Anatolia, including Aleppo and Aintab. And liquidation commission made a list of liquidated properties of the deportee 
and one copy of this list or record was supposed to have given to the deportee. Other copies and sale records were written in notebooks. Those notebooks had two copies. One was kept by the president of liquidation commission and another copy was by responsible secretary of the CUP. So we know for good, these records do exist, but inaccessible. Over the course of my one and a half year research in Ottoman prime ministerial archives, all my requests to see these records were denied or turned away. So the first Yakupian document includes a list of the family's properties registered by the Ottoman bank in order to be submitted to the Eintap liquidation commission immediately following the family's deportation. The second document consists of another list, which indicates the commission's auction results, along with detailed information on buyers and prices of these assets. And therefore, this record is an original document of the official transaction revealing for the first time the process of liquidation and auction executed by the Eintop Liquidation Commission. The properties listed in the Yakupian documents were registered at the Ottoman Bank on behalf of Sarkis Yakupian and his family on October 19, 1915. The bank surrendered these properties to Eintop Liquidation Commission on May 13, 1916. Soon after, on June, on June, uh, uh, June 1st, the commission auctioned these properties. The list dated May 13th um, includes the number and type of the mobile goods and items, as well as real estate, whereas the list dated June 1st offers the details of who purchased these assets, assets and at what price. As can be seen in the table, most of the Yakupian's possessions consist of household goods, household, household goods, and most of the buyers were members of the Eintop CUP, including provincial elites and civil and military officers and local state officials. Among the household, household items, majority came from the kitchen, as you see, uh, bathroom and salon. From the kitchen, pots, soup bowls, plates, set of cutlery, and a yogurt container were sold. From the bathroom, multiple basins, a laundry boiler, and a bath vessel were sold. Ahmeta, in particular, took advantage purchasing more items than any other buyer. A total of seven rocks were sold with one of fetching 1,405 piastres from Demir, Demir Muhsin, for instance. Let me show you another list. As you see the whole house of items, even a yogurt container, coffee meal, water vessel, for instance, two water vessels was, were purchased by Musa Efendi with the 41 piastres and the, the list goes on. Beyond the household goods, a number of valuable items were included for sale too. There were a few pieces of silver, but, but most, of, uh, most, most were of gold, okay? Let me show, show you, there you go. And four gold bristles, one gold watch band, 10 gold rings, and two gold earrings. Additionally, a handful of other assorted items were listed, such as one steel yard, one child's pillow, and five trade no no uh, notebooks. Uh, so many of the landed properties lost had been in Yakupian family for roughly five to 10 years, by the way. And so these, there were, you know, buyers who purchased the, this immobile properties of Sarkis Yakupian and his family at ridiculously ridiculous prices uh, uh, were in this image as well. So upon close examination, the list of buyers include various family familiar names from Araman Donyan's perpetrator list. For example, although his participation in the auction was prohibited, Tevfik Efendi, the chairman of Aintab Liquidation Commission was one of the buyers. Among the other buyers were Daizade Ahmet Turşit Bey, Hacı Halil Efendi, Mennanzade Mustafa. Mennanzade Mustafa, by the way, was the president of the Aintab CP club at the time. And Halilzade Ahmet, all permanent members of the Aintab's Committee of Union and Progress Party club who play active roles in deportations. Besides these figures, additional buyers of the Yakupian's properties can be found in the perpetrator list, again, provided by Araman Donyan. 
as well. So what do these documents show us? These documents meticulously demonstrate that local actors assume direct roles in the deportation and destruction of Armenians. They were motivated by material gain from liquidated Armenian properties and benefited from a so-called legalized regime of plunder. The Yakupian documents indicate how meticulously organized the looting was and offer a glimpse of the similar documents locked in the Ottoman archives. So, uh, as can be seen from the Yakupian case again, numerous government officials and other individuals were employed to manage this process, sale of our main assets through the abundant properties laws. At the direct level of implementation, prospect of looting motivated that motivated the local collaborators from different classes in Aintab. In most areas, Committee of Union and Progress Party relied to a considerable extent on the cooperation of the local administration, institutions, and state officials, as well as local notables and ordinary citizens. So deportation and genocide of Aintap Armenians were not implemented by a rebel brought in from the countryside to carry out an act recognized as too despicable for respected people, nor performed by Aintap's more ordinary have-nots, but rather were brought about by the district's Muslim notables, landowners, dignitaries, and the city's elites. So they prospered through the acquisition of Armenian property and wealth, elevating them into an even more privileged position. And this process of redistributing Armenian properties illustrates the close relationship between the CUP officials and, 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 and uh, local Muslim elites. So to conclude, uh, as a native son of Gaziantep in modern day Aintab, I now, I, 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 I now fully realize that through having attended the same schools with grandsons and granddaughters of those elites, I myself have witnessed the consequences of Aintab Armin's physical and material destruction. So my account here can offer insight into local history, but of course, uh, it's only a small step in understanding the complete picture of not only what happened, but also how and why these events transpired. And unseen in the archived letters, telegrams, and property leads are the trauma and suffering of our main survivors, repeatedly subjected to attacks on their lives, culture, assets, and social uh, status. So the base motives of their former neighbors, unfortunately, left some of the most indelible wounds, which more than uh, a century later remain uh, unhealed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kurt, uh, for that presentation. Uh, go ahead and um, close the PowerPoint uh, so that we'll take a look at you. There we go. Very good. So at this time, uh, we're going to open it up for uh, questions. Please use the chat uh, format at the bottom of your screen to ask questions. While you're doing that, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and ask the, the first question because you, you, you discuss in your book how so very important the economic incentives were in the local level. But I'm wondering uh, what's the evidence that that economic incentive was already planned at the higher levels, let's say in Istanbul by, by the CUP Central Committee? So I'm asking is, was the incentive, economic incentive there from the beginning in the plan of, of deportations or was it something which became an opportunist uh, role and was taken advantage of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very important question. Uh, economic motivation for the CUP central elites actually was, uh, was out there in, uh, from the very beginning. And therefore, uh, they were very calculative and rational uh, to introduce these uh, abundant property laws, you know, uh, in order to first so-called administer these assets, properties, mobile and immobile, and then liquidate them uh, by, by looking at the process of deportation. But CUP, what CUP was aiming at 
uh, acquiring and obtaining and controlling these properties in order to finance the war, nationalize the economy, create middle class and upper middle class uh, 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 trades, tradesmen, merchants, and 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 Turkification of economy uh, was on the ground. And this process by the CEP was not initiated during the during the during the war or during the genocide. It was much more before the CUP intend to create these kind of national bourgeoisie, let's say, you know, uh, it was Talat Pasha's plan in the beginning and first executed against the goods and assets of Ottoman, Ottoman Gre uh, uh, Greeks in the, Asian, uh, in the Asian side and Western trace in 1913 and 1914. For instance, Jalal Bayar's activities were quite, uh, quite uh, 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 fresh and organized in those regions. But, <coughs> but what CUP uh, was not, CUP uh, did not take into consideration was that there were chaotic situations in the provinces, which the way in which CUP wasn't able to control because CUP wanted to have the lion's share of these properties in his own pocket. But the local, the local notables, in the case of Aintab especially, local notables were much more motivated to keep their up these properties for their own sake, for their own profit. Therefore, there were, in there were conflicts between the local elites and the CUP central elites in terms of how to control this confiscation process because the looting actually was not endorsed or approved by the CUP. But in some cases, CUP condoned these looting actions just because of the fact that the CUP needed the, uh, the, the, the support and, and recruitment of these elites, support, support of these elites, that's, why, that, that's the reason why they use economic motivation to prompt, to, to pull out the support of these uh, ordina this, this uh, prominent local provincial elites. Great. Uh, we have another question. Um, this uh, is in regards to uh, the comments you were making about your research in the Ottoman archives and in other places, but you had mentioned that you were denied access to certain documents. Could you elaborate on that as to what were the reasons uh, for that denial and what sure. again, you were looking for? Sure. Very good question. Uh, so the, the core of my research was about documenting and illustrating how property confiscation was executed and property and liquidation process was carried out on the ground at the local level. What I'm talking about is, is sheer official state transaction. Okay, so what we are talking about, of course, uh, the, all these, all these uh, 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 illegal activities were carried out under the veneer of legality, that's for sure, under the veil of law, but still, we need a kind of proof and documentation to show that how property liquidation process was carried out and executed by the liquidation commissions. As I have uh, emphasized uh, during my talk, there were approximately 35, 34, 35 liquidation, abandoned liquidation commissions established in various provinces and districts of the Asia Minor, including Aintab and Aleppo. And these commissions, as I have just shown in the case of Sarkis Yakupian's how Sarkis, Sarkis Yakupian, Yakupian's the family properties were liquidated in an auction. Uh, there were other auctions for uh, or regarding uh, uh, other families' properties and assets, especially movable properties. I'm talking about. So these reports, therefore, extremely important to show actually the intent to destroy. This notion of intent to destroy. I mean, if CUP, if Ottoman government was promising that, you know, this proper, the, you know, you, the, the, the deportation was temporary, you will be returned to the, your homes and you will get your properties back. If you promised that, why would you carry that all these liquidation transactions to someone's properties? Because from the beginning, they thought the moment Armenians left their hometowns, it didn't, they didn't exist in the, in the eyes or in the minds of the Ottoman central authorities. So that's why everything was possible for these central authorities to execute any kind of transaction on, the, on, on these people's properties. So excuse 
the, the, the underlying reason why these sources are inaccess still inaccessible in Ottoman archives is that if these sources uh, are accessible for researchers, the whole looting process, whole robbery, the state official robbery is going to be, is going to come out, you know. That's why, uh, and also we, we, we will see the purchasers, buyers who constitute the, 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 uh, the, 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 the first capitalist of Turkish Republic. And these and the, the relatives and the offshots of these families are still living in Turkey. You know, uh, that's these are the reasons why these sources are still inaccessible. Thank you. And uh, I have a question. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, quite a bit about the personal properties, the personal, the homes, the maybe businesses, personal effects. But could you comment on the uh, major institutional structures? So what happened to the Armenian churches? Armenian schools in Aintab, how were they, how were they divided? Who took them over? Uh, was that something the state took over? Just explain a little bit of, of that, if you would. Sure. Um, for instance, um, generally most Armenian properties were used for the necessities of the army and government. For this purpose, uh, by August 12th, 1915, as far as I remember correctly, a central government order uh, was sent to various provinces and districts stating that our main properties could be transferred to military if needed. So uh, the abundant stock in the stores will be appropriated by the authorities in accordance, in accordance with the needs of the military. On 22nd of August, Surf Asvalasin Church, for instance, the Armenian Gregorian Church, St. Mary Church, was sealed and after which all mobile items in it were sold at auction. Shortly afterward, it was turned into a military station by the government by government order. And also during the deportations, all of the non-Muslim schools were seized by the government, except those belonging to American board. Ottoman army also appropriated the buildings of Vartanyan and Barsumyan schools uh, as well. And 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 what else I would say? Um, the second Protestant church was turned into a stable, for instance. And the Surp Asvazesin church was used for military prison for a while as well. Most of the mobile items within the Armenian churches were sold uh, at auctions with extremely low prices. And Okay. But in the first, yeah, but at the beginning of the deportation, these churches, mostly Surf Asazasin Church, was used for storing mobile items. But and then those items, including the items of the church, were sold at auction and used by the, the, by, for meeting the necessities of the Ottoman military, uh, Ottoman army. But That's later in the, in the Republican period, I believe that many of them were converted to mosques and to our, yes. the major mosques in, in the city. Exactly. Yes. The former yes. Churches. Kurtuluş Cami Liberation Mosque, uh, which is still alive in the city, it does exist, and uh, it was of of course this 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 uh, the Surp Asvazasin Church in the 60 in the 70s the Surp Asvazasin Church was used for again prison. Uh, most of the leftists in Turkey in 70s, for instance, were imprisoned in Surp Asvazasin Church, and after 1980 military coup d'état in Turkey. Uh, the whole church was transformed into a mosque, which was which has been known as Kurtuluş Cami, Liberation, Liberation Mosque, by only putting a, a kind of crescent on top of the church. Okay, there was another question, uh, and you had mentioned a little bit about uh, that in other provinces there were similar similar uh, liquidation commissions. But the question is, did this happen only in Antab or in other provinces such as Kesarya, Urfa, Marash, etc.? So elaborate yeah, a little bit more. As yes, yes, yes. It's 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 another. It's a very good question as well. Of course, these. I mean, as I as I have, you know, stressed, these commissions were established in more than thirty Ottoman districts, provinces, and dis districts, and including Kayseri. Uh, there is an excellent work 
regarding what happened to mobile and immobile properties of uh, Kayseri Armenians in Kayseri during the deportation and genocide and aftermath by Oya Gözel Durmaz. Uh, and his, her dissertation actually uh, was turned into a book and published uh, almost a year ago by Libra Publishing House. And Oya, uh, my colleague and a good friend of mine, she analyzed and ex explored how confiscation and liquidation process was carried out in Kayseri by giving names, the buyers of these properties and so forth. And Urfa Maraş, the same process took place, but I would like to uh, 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 underline one point, which is the following. Uh, we should keep, uh, the, fo keep, that, uh, keep uh, the, the, the follow following point in mind that looting and confiscation process as a state official transaction went hand in hand. State, the CUP, had to condone or overlook overlook all these looting and plundering activities because in return for receiving and taking support of these ordinary Muslims, local notables, Muslim elites, in order to execute deportation orders and, and also massacres and so forth. So the CUP needed this support, this uh, uh, consent of, of Muslim people to, to, uh, to, to realize their plans vis-a-vis -vis, uh, towards the Armenians. So therefore, liquidation commission reports and their records are extremely important for us to show what happened to properties and assets of other Armenians in different across Anatolia. Thank you. And uh, if you'd like to ask questions, we have time for just a few more questions. Please use the chat uh, function. I have another uh, question for you. Uh, recently, the Harant Dink Foundation prepared a, a, a large book about uh, confiscated properties and the fate of properties all over uh, Turkey. But my question is, if, if someone were to have uh, documents from that period, let's say an Armenian from Eintab had, had the documents for their home, that's, uh, what, what, what would the Turkish government do now? I mean, is, is it been legally now? Everything was legally transferred. So now it's all considered to be legally the property of those who confiscated those properties? Unfortunately, yes. Because abundant property laws, they were valid and, and practice, legally practiced, so-called legally practiced in Turkey until 1989. Uh, imagine how they used laws and regulations which were uh, uh, promulgated during the CUP era and they were revised and also added some more details to existing laws and have, were still being used until 18, 1989 in Turkey because the state officials wanted to make sure of the fact that they didn't leave any legal, any, any loophole, any room for any Armenian cli cli claim about their properties. But, but uh, there is a legal process. So are any descendants of Armenians, if they, had, if they uh, have a trustworthy lawyer in Turkey, you know, a reliable lawyer, they can use the, the, these lawyers by giving them power of, power of attorney. And these lawyers are allowed to enter the title deeds archives to see, to check trajectory of the properties in question so you, they, they could easily see what happened to the properties in question, who took it first, and then uh, who owned later, and then who possessed the property, uh, property at the moment. So through this process, the lawyer open, can open a lawsuit in Turkish courts. So that's why, you know, uh, it's very important to exhaust the domestic, Turkish domestic you know, legal processes before going to the European Court of Human Rights. Because unless you do that, European Court of Human Rights always will always give the verdict that, you know, first you should exhaust the domestic laws and then come to the higher court, international court. So that's why the best way is to open up a lawsuit in Turkey because the, the Turkish judges have to take this lawsuit, have to take a look at the file your fire, your lawsuit. But of course, the result, uh, unfortunately, may not be, you know, positive for, for the sake of 
uh, our main clim climate, climate, let's say. But also this situation uh, depends on, highly depends on the political climate in Turkey too. So now when you look at the political situation in Turkey, it's quite grim and bleak. So it, it, it must be extremely difficult to be able to find out a trustworthy lawyer to follow these procedures. Thank you, uh, Dr. Umit Kurt. Uh, I have uh, posted for everyone in the chat the uh, link to his book, Armenians of Eintab, uh, which is a very important, uh, again, book, The Economics of Genocide in an Ottoman Province. It's available through Harvard University Press. I've also uh, put in the chat the upcoming link for the Zoom lecture on November the 12th. I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Kurt, for joining us and really giving us insight into your publication. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you very much for giving the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you 